Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, I think it's, uh, we, um, we'd, we'd like to start uh, day two of the um, uh, uh, Pathogens Project, creating the framework for tomorrow's pathogen research. Uh, my name is Ravi Gupta, one of the co-chairs. And um, I'd just like to start by, of course, thanking you all for joining us again, and of course, um, those of you who are online following us. Um, uh, I also want to just recap day one, really, so that we can remind ourselves um, uh, of what's been discussed. Very briefly, we, we started with a panel discussion of uh, a, a group of virologists from around the world trying to identify what we believed were key risks um, and key challenges from a point, the point of view of studying pathogens with pandemic potential, uh, whether they uh, related to work that we're doing in laboratories to try and better understand them, or whether it was to do with um, uh, uh, contact between humans and animals, and how we may move forward in terms of creating a strategy or framework from which people can work globally in a, in a safe manner. We then heard from a, an expert group of panelists who represented various organizations, and we went to the supranational level, as it were, uh, uh, and heard about their efforts to engage stakeholders and to uh, uh, work towards a, a, glaif, a safe, um, uh, biosecure environment, uh, uh, engaging all uh, key individuals across, the, across continents. And then uh, in the last session, we, went, we drilled down to country level and heard about particular challenges individuals are facing uh, in their respective countries in terms of doing pathogen research, what's available to them uh, uh, in terms of government uh, 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 guidance, and where future challenges may lie and, and where the opportunities lie. And so this morning, it uh, gives me great pleasure to continue uh, that uh, discussion of country level uh, challenges and experiences. Uh, uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Uh, George Gao, who is Vice President of the uh, National Natural Science Foundation of China. Dr. Gao is, uh, uh, is, is obviously very well known globally, um, being the head of the China CDC at the start of the pandemic. He uh, trained as a veterinary um, uh, surgeon and, uh, and then went into microbiology, training uh, in Oxford uh, uh, in immunology as well as vi virology before moving to Harvard, where he continued work in structural biology. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, moved back to China and has been at the Chinese Academy of, of Sciences and works in the area of uh, pandemic pathogens and emerging pathogens uh, and is both uh, trained in virology, immunology and structural biology. And from my point of view, and that's an excellent combination of, of skill sets for anybody who's uh, in a policy uh, uh, um, or, or a um, uh, decision making uh, a role because, of course, understanding the breadth of, of scientific endeavor is really important when we deal with new and emerging pathogens so that you can harness the, the, the knowledge that's out there in order to, to best tackle uh, the, the, the challenge you're facing. So without further um, uh, ado, I will uh, present to you um, Dr. George Gao. Thank you for your introduction. And, uh, Thanks to the organizers to, for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure to talk you something about biosafety and biosecurity in China. And as we are here for tomorrow's pathogen research, so, so why we are here? We want to prevent the next potential possible uh, pandemic. So let's start with the word. You know, uh, I realized yesterday when I talked to uh, Philippe, and uh, you there French, you also use the biosafety and biosecurity could be, you know, the same word in French, and you Chinese could be the same. But we try to divide those two words, you Chinese, as two different words. You know, you read this Chinese. I think, I know a lot of people, you can read Chinese. But uh, when you s direct translate, it's biosecurity, biosafety in China. You Chinese, it's one word. The first one, we call it Sheng Wu Aichuan. Now, I really want to pay condolences to my mentor um, at Oxford. I did a PhD, studied with uh, real virology with Ernie Good, who just passed away uh, last month. And also in memory of my second postdoc uh, mentor, Don Wiley, for structural biology. So, 
So I studied at the vet, and then virus, bacteriology, structural biology, and immunology, so, and vaccinology, you know, I'm doing something, and epidemiology as well. So this is me, but I want to memorize those two, just, you know, passed away, and uh, they are great scientists. They taught me uh, to be a scientist. <clears throat> First part, let me give you a very quick introduction about the biosafety and biosecurity in China. So SARS is a really a turning point for China. We did a great deal of the jobs, and not just for the facility, but also for the regulations. Go and read the regulations, laws in China. Maybe we have the most stringent you know, laws or regulations in China. Go and visit the labs. We also have the most strict settings. Go and read, go and have a look in China. You know, I was in ha at Harvard, I worked at uh, Oxford, I visited so many countries, especially for the BSR3 lab or BS4 lab. You know, go and read, go and there, regulations, laws, facilities, they are okay. They are good, they are in good quality. I think, you know, a lot of audience, my friend, you visit China, because SARS is a turning point. <clears throat> for the biosafety, you know, we pay a, a great deal for the biosafety because it's so important. And laws, regulations, and the standards, you know, we have laws, uh, we have, you know, it's as a national law. We also have regulations, we have a lot of national regulations. We put, you know, so many standards, and go read them, some of them are already translated into different kind of languages, including English. And also, you know, for the management, as I said, laws, regulations are there. You know, you have everything there. Where is the implementation? Where, the, where is the execution? And to, in my opinion, it's always there. It's in good place. It's because we have what we call the full chain management. You know, starting from the sample collection, sample transportation, and to sample processing. And then for the recording, for the data storage, analysis, so everything. It's in the full set. So this is, you know, all this for the biosafety. Give you an example, even for the transportation, even for me, it took a long time for all this paperwork. For the scientists, usually we would, we would complain why it took so long time. But that's something necessary. You got to do it. So this is general, you know, in China. And also, you know, preservation and storage and go and visit it. I think you are welcome to come and visit at a lot of friends because we have a US-China joint meeting for the biosafety and biosecurity. For the last, uh, I think the, the, I was the coordinator of the China side. My pre vice president of China Academy of Sciences, Dr. Zhang Yaping, was the chair. And Diane Griffin, in the US, um, US uh, NAS, is the chair. We have a joint meeting before, now we are talking about before COVID and after COVID. We are living in the world divided by COVID. So before COVID, our communication is very good. We had, you know, dialogue and meetings. All those academicians and NAS members, we will get together to make sure biosafety is enforced in both countries. Sometimes we would invite some students like the Japanese or someone from Thailand and the UK scientists would join us. That's a very good program. So even when we have this SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, we immediately had this laboratory biosafety guidelines. So it's so clear. Of course, this was attacked. Thought we try to limit, to restrict people's research. It's not. So this is because from the very beginning, this virus was defined as BSR-3 virus. So you have to follow all these guidelines. So that's, you know, it's so clear. And uh, we have all this for the hospitals and uh, for the CDC system and for all these systems, you know, all the guidelines, all the paperwork are there. We learn from you, US, UK. You know, as I said, SARS is the turning point. We had some lab leakage at that time. We have to admit. So we realize that's very important. That's very, very important. So this is why you know, everything is in order. 
And also, more importantly, we even put a new journal. This is edited by our chief biosafety uh, officer, uh, expert, Wu Guizhen, for biosafety and health to make Chinese research for all those pathogens transparent and open. So me, I learned from MMWR, China CDC. We had a new journal called China CDC Weekly. That was started in November 2019. So I remembered, you know, even in the Lancet Journal, they, they have a profile, you introduced me. They are claiming appointment of George Gao as the DG of China CDC means China's outreach for the world. So you have all this China CDC weekly by Safety Health. That's two examples of new journals. Now, everybody wants to know what happened in the early days, early days during this pandemic, what we have learned from this COVID-19 pandemic. I would say, I would say three threes. What three stages in China? First, lockdown containment, then zero COVID, and then now dynamic. So in general, would you this state? And uh, three steps, science-based, public understanding, public involvement, and political will, and uh, ad swift ad administration decision. Those three steps. And then you have uh, three pieces of work done immediately. The, vir the disease was first seen in Wuhan, China. The virus was first isolated in China by China CDC, by my group, our group. The sequence was first released in Jishat from us, from China. And also epidemiological parameters were released through the New England Journal of Medicine. Everything's there. I think no one ever thought this could be a pandemic like this one. So this is what I call three threes. And public contributions for the China CDC or China's uh, measures, of course, a lot of argument, a lot of challenge, sometimes it's attack. But let's tell you what China has done, what we see. In the whole world, the rest of the world, you have, a, I call it, you have a lake. Can you see the spring? Where the water comes from, you can't. But China, we have the spring. Whenever, you know, we lock down and after the lockdown, on April 8th, the virus, the disease is not in China anymore because of lockdown and containment. I said because that's the community level. That's something cannot be done, implemented in China because of we have very strong community level measures. Community level is a key for the public health issue. So anyway, so we have the spring, you have the lake. We have the waves, you have a tsunami. So this is exactly what happened here. And um, I said three steps, science-based, public involvement, and uh, administration decision, I called seeking the truth, being pragmatic. For any administration work, you know, you, science-based, when you do something for impl implementation administration, being pragmatic. You can do something by size. For example, because I was trained as a vet, I know the animal field. Whenever you have a virus, foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, Kali, kill the host. That's it. By science, great. By science, you could do that for COVID-19 and, uh, COVID and SARS-CoV-2. Can you do that? You practice? No way. So this is why science and administration, sometimes they are so different. So what the early days? Late December, we had some PUE, pneumonia with unknown etiology. PUE always regarded as the first line of the most dangerous disease. Everyone sitting here. We are sitting here with this bulletin of atomic scientists. We are get together together. We are experts. You are journalists, but you have an interest for the emerging re-emerging pathogens. You are scientists working in this field. You are administrator, you are doing with this management of bio-risk, biosafety. So we know PUE number one. So initially we have some pieces of coronavirus uh, genes from the third party service. You know in China, in the hospital, such a big country, we have third party service. They did some, they detected something. And there's some noise and uh, uh, voices. So in China CDC, we have four systems to catch those 
We have a flu network, everybody knows. We are collaborating lab for WHO. We have an ILI, influenza like illness uh, network system. We have a SARI, severe acute respiratory illness uh, service system network. We have public health emergency events detection system. All those four would help you to catch anything. It's 24 hours on alert. But you know, from very beginning, because no one knows what is, this is. So this is why, you know, from very beginning, maybe only a sporadic case or cases. So this is exactly what happened in the early stage. But once we know it is pieces of change, it's coronavirus, it sounds like we are on the business. Immediately, lockdown, containment, all these measures. And because it's, it is known for any coronavirus, it's very difficult to grow. So from the very beginning, I'm involved. We tried many, many cell lines. We tried organoids. We tried lung tissues. Here we have got some of the scientists doing, working on the lung transplantation. We got pieces. We tried. But within five days, it grows very well in viral cells. Why is that? Then that will link to the you know, origins of whatsoever. People will say, well, this is the virus. You know, a lot of conspiracy stories, man-made. Lab leakage, the virus already adapted to the cell lines very well. Well, it's possible. It's logical thinking. Where's the evidence? Where are the facts? The facts are the facts. That's the great philosopher Bertrand Russell said. The facts are the facts. We do have these facts, but initially we tried, we got the virus. Look, corona, because it looks like this. On the 7th January, we got this, and then me, Chen Wang, Peter Hobby, Fred Hayden, two Chinese, one British, one American. We wrote something, formally published January 24th. Can you see the submitted date? Must be under peer review, much earlier than this. We claim it could be a global health concern. That's our title. And then we released the genome on the 10th through g -Shirt. Everybody knows G-Shirt. G-Shirt is a kind of a, uh, private, but now it's German under German uh, government. So G-Shirt released the sequence on the 10th. Of course, there's an argument. So as a scientist, I don't want to do any argument. Even in the early days, I was attacked. I kept quiet. I don't want to make anything big mess. We want a science. We want a disease under control. We don't want to quarrel. We don't want to argue. We just want the science. We want uh, exact measures or measures, we can get the disease under control. Tenth, that's the first day. We have three correct, I use the word correct. Someone released pieces, someone released wrong sequence, withdrew, and then re-release. So this is exactly what happened. And um, let's give you some evidence. New England Journal of Medicine, Pfizer, BioNTech um, vaccine de developed based on this 10th general release sequence. And this uh, European for the diagnosis based on that. Another, another one in the European country, they did this and they claimed on the 10th January, they got this sequence, they developed the diagnosis case. Only, and um, why do we have COVID? Why? Is it um, a black swan or gray rhino events? You know, what the probability? I was a member, not a member anymore. I was a member of the GPMB, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, headed by Gru Brutland, former DG of WHO, former Prime Minister of Norway. We were sitting together. I, I fly here quite every year for this meeting. In the end of 2019, we have an annual report claiming flu coronavirus are the most likely pathogens which would cause pandemic. See, we know that but we are not ready. And I was in the event 201 organized by Tom Inglesby in the Johns Hopkins uh, Public Health on the October 18th, 2019. Again, exactly before the COVID. The disease, we have a table exercise. We have a suspected you know, enemy. It's called CAPS. Coronavirus associated pneumonia syndrome, exactly like the COVID-19. You know, and then by that time, it's everything on the internet. And then in China, I was attacked. So George, you went there, 
And the American told you they are going to release the virus. Hmm, you got the virus? You came back to China? Here you go. Conspiracy story. <laughs> very, very typical. You know, let's come back to science. So we know we have an exercise. We know it could be a coronavirus. Coronavirus associated pneumonia syndrome, everything in the internet. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you what happened. This is even too much. We know knowledge about rootic virus, migrants, birds, chicken, ducks, pigs, and human. Ebola may be bats, mammals, and human beings. All this story. But now I'm challenging you this. Do we really have an intermediate host for the coronavirus? We need to rethink. Put it back to size, rethink. So far, we have seven coronavirus for human infections. The, everybody remember SARS, the first one in 1965, and then two years later, and you have the second one, and the 204, you have OR63, you have HKU1. For the orange HKU1, HKU1 was isolated by KY in Hong Kong. This is why it's called HKU1. You know, for a long time, the scientists, virologists, they are so lazy, they didn't want to have this virus, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omicron. They named it as a place where you isolate the virus. So, Hong Kong University number one. So with this virus, it confirmed by Brazilian scientists. In 1995, some samples stored in the freezer, they have the HK1, 1995. Because it's not a pandemic, no one really noticed this. And then you, of course, you have MERS, and you have COVID-19. For MERS, beautiful story, bats, dromedary, human. Now we need to you know, rethink, revisit about this hypothesis. For SARS, SARS. Civic cat, maybe before civic cat, it's a bat. Bat, civic cat, human. I'm calling, let's move back to rethink whether or not this hypothesis would work. I leave this because scientific question, all the scientific must be open. Leave it open, let's wait what we, we could get. And then for the COVID, we know. The virus was first seen, first identified, first isolated from human samples or environmental samples. We did the environmental sample. But the virus got into mink, so many animals. Now we know. You will never think mink is the intermediate host. You, we thought human to mink. We never thought mink to human. Now what about a civet cat? Maybe human to civet cat, not civet cat to human. Anyway, we need rethink. There's no evidence. We need evidence. We need facts. Back to 2060, I was asked by the transient microbiology. I'm doing administration work, also I'm a scientist. I'm doing a lot of research on corona and flu-related virus, Ebola as well, emerging viruses. I wrote, it is likely not a matter of if, but when we will have a coronavirus causing epidemic, even pandemic. 2016. And 2018, I was asked by the journal Cell. I, I was sitting there as an advisory board member. Can you write something about what we can do for the emerging emerging virus? I said in that paper, it's paper, 2018. You, we cannot do anything, only two things we can do. Two things. First, surveillance. Second, basic research. You invest your money for the emerging emerging virus research. Get your money there. Basic research, because we don't know which virus, when we will have another pandemic. So surveillance, surveillance, basic research. The important thing I would say three times. So basic research, basic research, basic research. Surveillance, surveillance, and surveillance. Now, origin, raccoon dogs, pangolin, bats, a lot of stories you read a lot. I don't want to exaggerate anymore, but there's no conclusion. Before our nature was accepted, you know, a lot of scientists thought, okay, it's raccoon dogs. Now I think there was now get a little bit lower, lower down. Maybe the raw data there, they did reanalysis, maybe it's not. Anyway, so that's a long story. And this time, for the human beings, we did, a, I call it a saturated vaccine development. We did such a short period of time. We got so many vaccines, especially in China. You now we have so many vaccines under, under clinical use or under clinical investigation. And um, for the 1918 flu, you are talking about 25 to 50 million death toll. This time, less than 10 million. We, we did achieve a great deal. Of course, for the public or the politicians, they thought they want zero. 
we always have a life expectancy. You can't live forever, right? But this is why I think you know politicians and the public they demand more. Last time I you know a week ago I I was in London. Tony Blair gave a, a keynote. That's the meeting supported by Road Trust, Road Trust meeting, discussing the name called Early On, like this one called Positive Research, Tomorrow's Positive, that one called Always On. That's the meeting theme. Tony Blair gave a talk, he used the words, okay, I'm a politician sitting here, standing here, you know, all the audience, you are experts, but I still have to say something. He used the word but. I was sitting the panelist, and um, I said, okay, Mr. Blair, Tony said, but, Ask the scientist. Scientists would say, however. You know the words, however. Scientists found something, however, that's one, however, that, however, however. Remember, you know the public. The public would do, they use an even stronger word. Nonetheless. Come on, man, scientists, you are working so hard. You, we invest for you for basic research. Here's the virus, here's the pathogen. Get it done immediately. They use the word nonetheless. However, as a scientist, I use the word however. Saturated vaccine development save millions, billions of life. You have to be really careful about that. You know, from time we were from early days, I, I wrote a commentary in my journal called China CDC Weekly. If we don't share the vaccine, the virus will share the world. Now the virus said the word. We still couldn't work together. I'm calling here for the tomorrow's part of the research. Let's work together. Nonetheless, work together is more important. However, work together is more important. But work together is more important. Remember those but, however, and nonetheless. So as I said, the virus collaborate each other very well. Alpha, beta, gamma, now Omicron, Omicron, BA dot something, BA dot something, XBB something, and then you know, XA something, you know. Okay, name it. They work so well. Great collaboration for the virus, one by one. And then they escape all the therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. You know, this is the work from micro public immunity. They escape all the available monoclonal antibodies. Now I want to remind everybody why we were working so hard. We are thinking about, we did a great job. Remember, new pollens. Now it's sea mammals. So we have to be really careful. We want a green world, we want a green earth, but we are doing some contaminations for the world. So what lessons we learn, and what we should learn from the COVID-19? One word, remember the word, global. Now we have deglobalization here, everywhere. But we have to call everybody, try to work together. Let's work together, not the virus. Remember, we are living in a global earth. That's a very small village. It's a small village. We are all villagers, you know, <laughs> living together, the global. And, uh, and also, more importantly, those two words, I remind everybody, we are discussing for a long time, tolerance and resilience. Tolerance means tolerance to the environment, tolerance to the microbes. Look at me, cut me, have me, Dr. Gupta, cut me. How many cells do I have? 10 to the power of 13, roughly. Cut me again. How many microbes I carry? At least 10 times more than my cells. 10 to the power of 40. I am a mixture of my skeleton cell and microbes. So the Earth, how old the Earth? 47, 407 billion years. And we have the human beings, the, what we call, we call them homo sapiens, only one species. The virus, corona, SARS, SARS-CoV-2, two different species. You and me, black, white, you know, doesn't matter. We are one species. They have SARS-1, SARS-2, two different species. We are only one, homo uh, sapiens. So we have to tolerate each other. So this is my last call. This is the lesson we should learn. Otherwise, we have another even worse pandemic. 
So for the post-COVID, I created those two words. We do want phobia. We do want hypognosia. We need to work together. I call it coronaphobia, corona hypognosia. So, you know, this is something, again, I'm calling it to work together. And also we should work together, try to prevent the euphodemiology. You know, at the early, early stage, Fauci, everybody, including me, we were attacked. Say, guys, you work so hard. We have had so much money for your basic research. Why couldn't you get the virus done? The virus, ooh, and the, the, the death to, ooh, you know, death to grow. The life, what happened? So I created another English word, infarus. It got approved by Tony Fauci. I said, okay, you have a euphodemic. You have the science for studying euphodemics called euphodemiology. What about the pathogen? The pathogen, I name it, euphemesial virus, euphorus. So I wrote a paper in China CDC Weekly last, last year. So okay, let's start, start to study euphorus and euphodemic, get a new science, new discipline as euphodemiology. So we need to work together for virology, epidemiology, immunology, vaccinology, but also we need to work together for the study of euphodemiology. We have so many journalists sitting here. This is your job. Make sure you deliver the correct information to the public. Make sure the public understand, the public evolved in whatever you are doing. You know, that's the lessons we should learn. Pandemic, euphodemic, both are so important. So what about the next virus, next coronavirus? Of course, not COVID-19, because I was the one, we do something in the land state. We were against the name of SARS-CoV-2. You know, because we have some new viruses, where people would think SARS-1, SARS-2, the same virus, same species. You know, we, and especially in China, it's called novel coronavirus disease. It's not. This one's novel, what about the next one? Novel, novel. What about the third one? Novel, novel, novel. So, you know, we need a good name. So, we have disease X. Okay, here you go. We have monkeypox. July 23rd, the W claimed another fake event. In the 21st century, starting from pandemic H101, 209, you know, we already have seven. And for the future, we need collaboration, competition, communication, and coordination. Those four C I wrote in the uh, public uh, the Lancet Global House with uh, uh, Africa CDC director John Kankerson. These four C we proposed, we need to work together for those four C. So welcome to visit China in Beijing. And uh, I helped to erect the statue for flu virus in 2018 to commemorate the 1918 pandemic. So to educate the public to understand what the virus looks like. Come visit the BD in my institute, the Institute of Microbiology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. So I have two jobs. Oh no, I have three jobs. <laughs> I have one job as Chinese Academy of Sciences, a scientist, DG of China CDC. So come and visit this. That was erected 2018. So it's so important. I initiated, thanks for the WHO agreed, Dr. Tai Zhu made a remark, World Flu Day, that's November, November 1st. Finally, I would cite the great philosopher Bertrand Russell. Let me try to mimic the British accent. I will try hard. You have so many British sitting here. In 1952, Lord, Russell was interviewed by a journalist of BBC. One last question, Lord Russell. Suppose this film would be looked at by our future descendants, say like Dead Sea Scroll, a thousand years time. What would you say to our future generation? Well, I should see two things. One is intellectual. For the intellectual, see, I would say, when you are studying any matters, or considering any philosophy, or keep asking yourself, what are the facts? The facts are the facts. The second thing I would say, moral. Two words he left for us. For moral, I would say, love is wise, hatred is 
foolish. I will stop here. Thank you very much.